the process that you're going to learn today is going to generate two possible assets by the end of the 10 step process. The first is what I call a presentation plan. And here's what a real one looks like. Okay, now there's a lot of words on the screen, which isn't good for you as the listener because I'm talking. So I'm gonna replace those words with these lines that represent text. And let me just give you a tour of what these kind of plans look like. And by the way, I'm gonna go ahead and turn off my video for now so you can focus on the visual aids. Now, a presentation plan starts with foundational material at the top. And this is the material that you're gonna generate using the first three steps. So again, you don't have to take copious notes now, I'll get into this, um, how you create this when we get to the first step. But I just want you to know, this is what's up top, the foundational material. The stuff down below is content. This is, these are the ideas you're gonna share in your presentation. Now you'll notice they're in groups, and I call these groups downloads, because ultimately, I have to get them into my long-term memory and be able to download them on command when I want to. Okay, so I call these groups downloads. They're just related ideas. At the top of each download is a key message, and I'm gonna show you how to create these key messages. They represent the spine of my presentation. And then all the stuff below the key messages, well, those are the discrete ideas that I'm gonna share. But I don't want you to ever think of these as a script because I don't want you to ever come across as scripted when you present. These are ideas that, will, that you'll share. Will you use some of the language in these ideas on the actual document? Well, yes, you're gonna repeat some of the words, but I still want you to think of them just as ideas so that in the moment you can be um, spontaneous and you can trust that you can find the words to deliver the ideas when you're presenting. All right, that's the presentation plan. And by the end of step eight in this process, I'm going to show you, you'll have a presentation plan. Now, I want to talk about the other asset you may have that I'm going to call visual aids, which you often call slides. Now, here's the problem with calling slides slides and why I purposely call them visual aids is because when I talk about slides, people, it's confusing. In the current paradigm, slides are thought of as the presentation. People will say, I'm working on my PowerPoint. I'm working on my presentation when they're just working on the visual aids for the listeners. Your presentation is not your slides. Your presentation is the listener's experience of you when you're talking. The visual aids, if they help, well, that's great. That may be part of the experience, but they aren't your presentation. Nonetheless, by the end of this process, through steps nine and 10 in the process, you may end up with slides that look something like this. Now, again, I'm just gonna give you a version of these slides without words and things like that. And in this particular example I'm gonna go through today, data is really the only visual aid type that we're gonna share. You may work on presentations where images or quotes or um, diagrams or those sorts of things come into play, okay? But I'm gonna use a different example, doesn't matter. It works for all kinds of presentations, what we're doing here. Nonetheless, in the end, you walk out with these two possible assets, okay? Now, I spoke about a foundation. How do you create a foundation for your presentation? Well, there's three parts to the foundation of any presentation. The first part is, who's the audience? What do they like at the beginning of the presentation? The second part is the goal. What's your goal for transforming these people by the end of the presentation? And the third part is what's your core message to get them from here to there? And in the process that we're going to use, I suggest we always start with the end. We start with the goal. That'll be step one. Then we'll move on to analyzing our audience so that we get to know what they're like when they come to us. And then finally, we'll be able to craft a great core message based on those first two steps. So step one is defining your goal. Now, this is really straightforward. I want you, when you're defining your goal, just to complete this sentence. It's one sentence. By the end of this presentation, my listeners will. Now, here's the problem. When I first put this out to people and ask them to complete this sentence, they'll often use the wrong verbs. 
they may use the verb know. By the end of this presentation, my listeners will know what my organization does. That's not particularly great. They may use will understand. By the end of this presentation, my listeners will understand what my organization does. Well, the problem is that with the no type of verb, you're begging to get into announcements. You're just going to do an info dump. So let me tell you about the history of my organization so you know about my organization. Boring. We'll understand it sounds more like a lecture. And lectures are boring too, where you're just explaining stuff. The purpose of most presentations is to shift beliefs and behaviors. That's the purpose. So we want to operate at that level. You may have to make people aware of some facts. You may have to help them understand some things, but that's not where you want to stop. You want to get them to shift their beliefs and their behaviors. So when you write out this goal, it should read something more like this. By the end of this presentation, my listeners will believe blank and will take action based on that new belief. Okay, so let me show you an example. Now, for this example, I chose the most mundane of presentations to show you this stuff works. And that's a quarterly update to a leadership team. Take a look at the goal. I write, by the end of this pre presentation, my listeners will believe that my sales team should focus on new hire coaching. And here's how they take action. They will lower Q2 and Q3 hiring and sales goals to accommodate. Okay. That's an example of a good goal for a presentation. It's one sentence, it's got the right structure and includes beliefs and actions, okay? Now, when you're analyzing the audience, it's all about getting to know who they are and where they are now at the beginning of the presentation. We'll do some analysis and I just like questions to prompt my thinking. So I'm gonna share some of the questions I use. You can list these, but it's really a mindset that you need to adopt about empathy and getting into the shoes of your audience. But here is the first question I like to ask. And that's what's the first word or phrase that comes to mind when I think of this audience? Now, here's a warning. If the first word or, or phrase that comes to mind is, well, these people are jerks, or this is, these listeners are the type of people that rudely interrupt me and make me feel small, I would step back from the laptop and go get yourself some tea and try to get some peace because you can't plan a presentation um, for an audience if you take a negative perspective toward them. So, but this is really a problem. I see people do it all the time. They, they look down on their audience and it'll taint your content. It'll come through, trust me. So here's an extension of that same question. What are they like? So I give beyond the first word I think of to list. What are the, they're busy people. Um, maybe they've got, um, a big home life, maybe they've got families. I just have to think of the whole person when I ask this question. Demographics might be relevant. They aren't always relevant. What we're trying to find are rel relevant attributes of the audience that we're gonna change. So maybe their age might be a factor, maybe gender might be a factor, those sorts of things. These, this is really the, these are the fun questions. I like this one. What gets them out of bed in the morning? Because what we're trying to do is understand the deeper motivators of the audience. What keeps them up at night helps us understand their fears. What are the things that, that are holding them back? What are their obstacles? Those sorts of things. What do they value? This is another deep question. What is really at the heart of what they value? Do they value creativity? Do they value safety? Do they value innovation? Think about those kind of deep um, drivers. And finally, here's a real practical one. What do they already know about the topic? because we don't want to go in there and go over old territory or lose them really quickly. Now look, this isn't the definitive list of questions to doing an audience analysis, but this gives you a really good idea of how to do it. Let me show you an example with this update example that I've crafted for you. So if my audience is the leadership team, maybe the first thing I think of is they're just very busy. They have meeting whiplash because they spend most of their life going to meetings and they have to change from meeting to meeting and their head is just flying because they're making big decisions very quickly. Um, what is a driver? What gets them out of bed? Maybe they love making a huge dent in the market. Maybe they're very aggressive and they want to be innovators and disruptors. 
Maybe they're worried about missing a first to market opportunity and I need to be sensitive to that because they really see an opportunity here, they wanna seize it. I know that they care about employees and company culture. So when I say that some of these folks are under stress, they'll get it. And I have to recognize that they feel that this product that I'm addressing could make us a market leader. So it's very important to them. These are the kind of things that should come up in your audience analysis. Now I only have five you may want to generate up to 15 different details about your audience. I don't typically go beyond 15 because then it overwhelms me, but somewhere between five and 15 details is probably the appropriate amount for you to have a good picture in your mind of what this audience is like, okay? Now, let's move to the core message. We know where we wanna take the audience, what they're like at the beginning, what's the core message we're gonna to use to get them there? Now, a core message, again, has a specific structure. This is the way I like to structure it. It's very straightforward. It's an if-then structure. If we or you do this, then this will be the reward. Or you could take a different tact. If we or you don't do this, then this will be the consequences. Um, you can use the positive or the negative. I'd be careful with the negative. I typically use the negative warning style core message with an audience that feels stuck to me, that I really need to prod um, out of where they currently stand and where their beliefs are to get them to move. Otherwise, I like to keep it in the positive, okay? Now, here's an example here of a core message, an if-then structure. If we make the time to properly coach up our new sales hires, will return to industry leading conversion rates and hit record revenue in Q4. Now, here's the secret to the core message, and that is what you are trying to do is find that one message that is gonna to get to the heart of your audience, that is highly relevant to them, that's gonna move them. And there are an infinite number of possibilities here for a core message. So if you have the time, take the time to write out a number of different versions of your core message. Force yourself to write out five or maybe even 10 versions of what that core message could be so that you can find the one that's gonna really resonate with your audience the most. It's critical. I think of presentations sometimes in this way. I've watched a lot of presentations that are total gutter balls. Somebody launches a presentation and it's a disaster from the start. And it's largely in part because they have no idea about the foundation of their presentation. I'm guaranteeing you, if you keep this mindset for every presentation you do that you are going to determine what's my goal, who's my audience, and what's the core message, you will seldom ever bowl a gutter ball of a presentation. You're always going to hit some pins. Now, if you have a really good core message, if it's the right core message for your audience, you're setting yourself up for a strike. So if time allows, and again, sometimes it doesn't, but if time allows, do your first draft of your foundational material and then set it aside for a day and give yourself room to breathe and think. Take a run, drive, whatever it is. And then sometimes right before you go to bed, you go, oh, I just thought of a much, much better core message. Okay, that's if time allows. Now, it's time for brainstorming. Once you have that, that foundational stuff, now it's time to get into the content. Okay, and this is where people struggle. It's all about quantity, not quality. <laughs> in workshops I teach, I'll give people seven or eight minutes to do a burst of initial brainstorming. And there will be some individuals that produce no more than 12 ideas in that eight minutes. And I know what's going on because they're focused completely on quality. They're envisioning the final presentation as they're brainstorming. Doesn't work. I get other people in those same eight minutes that produce almost 60 ideas. And ultimately, their presentations are more creative, they're more rich, they're more interesting. So you've got to find a way to let go of the, I've got to generate the perfect ideas here and just force yourself in a quantity. So in this example, I consider my core message and I again review my goal and my audience and then I just let my brain go. Sales were flat. We missed sales goals by more than 5%. We have a lot more sales activity. Uh, but the conversion rate has gone way down. The new hires are complaining a lot. Look, I just keep writing these ideas down as fast as they come, 
with no worry about the order of what I'm getting out of my brain. I'm not caring about flow. Um, some of the ideas might seem a little crazy or wacky. I leave them because they may turn into something quite brilliant. I don't know, but I've got to let open the floodgates and just get some material. And I keep going now. What I'm going to show you here, sometimes it'll slow down a little bit. Ultimately, put on a timer and force yourself to go for at least eight minutes. Force yourself to brainstorm. The idea here is a little bit like this. I'm just trying to come up with clay. I'm going to shape the clay into a presentation. I'm going to create a presentation. I'm going to give it form, but I need material to work with. The best way to create that material is through brainstorming. And just let your mind go and create as much as you can as fast as you can. Okay. Now, having done that, I need to begin shaping this stuff. Okay, I have the material. How do I shape it? Well, I'm going to do it by grouping these ideas. So I go through the list of ideas and I look at what's related. And let's say these first four ideas seem to go together. Maybe they're all ideas about the current situation in terms of data, the current situation reflected in numbers. And I go through all of my ideas and maybe I find on the second page that, oh yeah, there's an idea over, over here that belongs with those first four. Well, I'm working in word processing software, right? So all I do is cut and paste and now group everything in a single spaced fashion. When I was brainstorming, I like to double space. So I just create a bunch of space. Um, and every idea is equal, nothing's grouped. Now I put them in groups, single spaced and bring it together. Do it for the next group. Go, oh, these three ideas seem to go together, but these two ideas seem related as well. They all belong together because maybe they're a reflection of what's going on on the ground, what's going on behind the numbers with the current situation. Now I'm gonna go through this process for all the content and group it. And as I group it, what's bound to happen is more brainstorming. I'm going to group something and go, oh, there's another glaring omission here. There's another idea I need to add. And you'll go through all of your groups, having grouped them, and you'll start to find that there's ideas I want to add to this. We're still in that part of the process where we're adding ideas. Okay. Now I've got my material to work with, and it's taking some shape. Um, the next step is creating key messages. But I'm going to let the content tell me what those key messages should be. So let's look at the ideas from this group. It says sales were flat. We missed sales goals by more than 5%. We've got a lot more sales activity, but conversion rate has gone way down and we're hitting higher on the target. I ask myself, what am, what's the message that this is all suggesting I'm trying to get out? What's that core message? Oh, let me give you an example. Oh, I'm sorry. Just just make sure you understand what a core message is. A core message is a full sentence and it has an opinion. It's charged. It makes a statement. So back to this, here's an example. We missed our sales goal because we aren't converting leads like we should. Notice it is a complete sentence. Notice it has an opinion. It isn't a fact. It states something. It takes a perspective, right? It's persuasive. And that's what I want you to do with these key messages. I constantly have to remind people this because once they see these bullets, they start to think this is an outline. And in a sense, it is an outline, but I don't want you to put just a topic heading at the top of these groups. It has got to be a complete sentence because these key messages are going to become the spine of your narrative. They're going to become the organizing tools for the narrative. They've got to be sentences. So now you can see this example right here of my core message for this group. I'm going to do that for every group. And like I said, these key messages represent the spine of my presentation. And so I've got to have them to be able to organize my flow. Now, let's take a look at how you organize flow. So far, we got all these ideas out, we grouped them, and we gave them key messages, but we haven't thought about the, the order we want to place them in. So let's just say, I look at this first key message and go, it's a good one to start with. It makes sense. And this one, yeah, it's logical to make this the second message. That makes sense. 
But then I go, oh, but you know what? It's this key message over here that makes sense is the third key message. So I just cut and paste my groups. And I'll do that for the entire document. I'll get it into a flow. Now let's look at the flow of these first three ideas in the example I've been using. The first key message is, we missed our sales goal because we aren't converting leads like we should. Hmm. Makes good sense to start here. It's sort of an idea of what's going on. The second message is, rapid hiring has overwhelmed our ability to prepare new hires for success. This is the second key message for that second group. Oh, okay, so this explains why this is going on. And now, by slowing down now, we could go everybody up to full speed by Q4. That's sort of what should we do about this? This is a pretty good narrative spine, I like it. Now I wanna make an important point. This presentation example I'm using is the kind that is more conversation than presentation. Are all of you familiar with the show Shark Tank? These entrepreneurs go into the room and they give a very brief high level presentation up front. And then what do they do for the rest of the time? They have a conversation, okay, a conversation. And the example I'm using today of a Q1 update, it's the same idea. When I'm giving a Q1 update to a leadership group, this is gonna have to be more conversation than presentation, but I do need a high level opening presentation and I've got it here in these first three ideas. That's fantastic. So what about this stuff on the other side? What do I do with this if it's not part of my presentation? Well, these downloads should be in my mind and ready for conversation. Once I finish my opening presentation, I can say, okay, what are your reactions to what I just said? Um, do you have questions? What are your thoughts? Okay, and I wanna be careful that I don't think of this material after the opening presentation as a Q&A session. Listen, the, the, the tradition of having a Q&A session at the end of a presentation is horrible. It does not fit the listener's brain. And there's another problem with it. It always puts the speaker in a one-up position. It says, I'm the expert, you're not. I answer the questions you ask, you ask them. When in a lot of situations, especially in internal presentations, it's not the case. The people in your audience are experts too. So why do you have to be in the one-up position? And when you're presenting to leadership, when you're presenting up, they know you're not in a one-up position. So Q&A doesn't make sense. The other part about it is when you put it at the end, you ask everybody to suspend their thinking. If somebody is provoked by an idea you share early in your presentation, and you say, um, the rules of the current paradigm state that you have to wait till the end to express your reaction or your thought. Well, by that time, the flow of ideas has passed and their comment may no longer be relative or relevant. Look, dump the Q&A session concept. It's not a good concept. And go more for thoughts and reactions in conversation. The truth is, in a presentation like this, this backup material, this conversational material, you may not go through it all in the actual conversation because the flow of the, mic of the conversation may not take you there. Will you want to put it in an ideal flow, sort of a default flow? just in case the conversation unfolds as you anticipate? Well, yeah, but you may go through the whole meeting and some of this may not be brought up. You may bring it up in different order, but you will be prepared with a download of ideas to relevant ideas that are likely to come up in the conversation. Now it's time to get into refinement. We have our plan, but we've got to clean things up. When I'm refining, these ideas. I look at my core message and say, okay, now I need to organize these little ideas below, the material below, now into some kind of logical flow. I need to add to them. I need to subtract. I need to change the wording, tighten things up, maybe um, combine some of the points. And so I just did that here. I figure maybe we should flow in this flow. We hit hiring targets. We've got a lot more sales activity, but sales were flat. We missed sales goals by more than 5%. And that's all because the conversion rate has gone way down. We missed our sales goals because we're not converting leads like we should. Now notice what I'm doing as I reorganize these ideas and refine. I am talking through the ideas out loud. This is another little key to the process. 
Ultimately, what people are going to receive in your presentation is not written language, but spoken language. So when you're getting to the point of refinement, you want to say it out loud and listen to yourself. Listen to how the content comes across. That will give you great insight into how you should refine it, what words you should choose. It needs to be conversational in nature. In written language, you can have longer, more complex sentences and words because there's some permanence. In spoken language, there's no permanence. You say something and it's gone. So talk these ideas out loud, walk through them out loud. You don't have to read them exactly as they're written, but talk through the content and then refine, refine, move things around and get it to a point you're really happy with each download, okay? Most of this process of refinement should be subtractive. Find ideas that you thought you needed and then realize, no, this just adds fluff. This just makes things longer. I want my presentation to be efficient, concise, and to the point. Remove that unnecessary stuff and tighten things up, okay? That's the refining process. Now we're getting to the visual side of things. If I think visual aids might be in service to my audience in this presentation, I'm gonna go through the ideas one at a time and ask myself, does this call for a visual aid? Will a visual aid be helpful here? In this example, let's say the first idea, yes, the visual aid. The second idea, mm-hmm, a visual aid. Third idea, yeah, also a visual aid. This is all data, so I think they need to see the numbers. And then I go through all this, I go, oh, the second grouping, the second download doesn't really need any visual aids. But I go through the third and I recognize, yeah, there's some visual aids that would support this content as well. Now, now that I've identified that I need seven different visual aids for this presentation, and again, as you'll notice on the right side, that's conversational stuff. Sometimes I might want to plan to have some backup slides to support the conversational material. So, you know, I might have more um, visual aids that I want to create. But in this particular example, let's say it's just these seven points. I open up my slide software and I create nine blank slides. Well, why nine? Because I'm assuming, you know, just by convention that I'm going to start with the title slide and finish with the thank you slide. So that leaves me these seven slides here. Now, these are white um, slides. I just did that for, demo for demonstrating purposes. You would use your branded template for your work, but you would keep it empty of content, okay? And then you're gonna create a shell file. And what I mean by a shell file is on each slide, you're gonna put placeholder text, okay? And so this is example placeholder text directly from the example I've been sharing with you. They're all data displays, and I write data at the top, and then I'm very specific about what that data is. Now, I got rid of the words again, so you can imagine this could be any presentation. The placeholder text you put on these slides has to be in a very huge font so that you can look at your slides in this mode. The mode you see right here is, I'm, I'm working in Keynote, Apple's Keynote. This is called the light table mode. In PowerPoint, it's called the slide sorter mode. But this is like looking at the blueprint. Before I jump in and do all that, painstaking design work for the slides. I want to know what's this going to look like? What am I up against? How many slides do I need to design? And what, what do I need to put on these slides? Are there a lot of images? Am I going to do a lot of image sourcing? Creating a shell file allows you to see the plan before you get into the timely, difficult, and tedious work of design. So always create this shell file. Okay. Now, You'll notice that I have areas during this opening part where I don't need a slide up. In fact, I may have a slide like slide number four has data, but when I get into talking about my second key message, when I get into my second download, that visual aid may not apply. So what I tend to do is when I know I'm gonna have a portion where I'm gonna be talking, but I don't need a visual aid, I just insert a black slide. The black slide is awesome, it blanks the screen. Tells the audience to look back at you and to experience all that wonderful stuff you're doing in speaking. Okay, so black slides are a good thing. I like putting them in. If you don't want to put them in, but you want to have the option of blanking um, the screen, you can always hit the B key on your laptop when you're in presentation mode. Or if you have a presentation remote, there's a button on most remotes that allows you to mute the screen. Okay, 
Now it's finally designed, okay? And it, I'm not gonna teach you how to design slides in this short amount of time, but it is the last step of the process, which is interesting, because a lot of people jump into this as the first step of the process, which is a huge mistake. All I'm gonna do is look through my plan, look through my blueprint, look through my shell file, and decide which slide am I gonna attack first. I may have some existing assets I can put on the slide. I may have to, to do it from scratch. Doesn't matter, but I'm gonna start putting it together. And then I design this slide. And then I go, okay, now I'm gonna gather the stuff for this slide. And I just go through and get my assets and start developing my slides until I have a complete slide deck. The good news is that now that I'm designing these slides and I've done it based on a plan, I can be more self-assured that I'm not wasting a bunch of time. And let me add this detail, by the way. If you're working collaboratively with other people and you're gonna need people to give you approval or you're gonna to wanna to share this with a team to get consensus, get approval and consensus on the shell file. Get approval and consensus before you get into design work. Why waste all that time creating designs and then show it to your colleagues only for them to shoot it down and say, no, nah, let's not show that slide or I don't like that one. Tell them, look, I've got my presentation plan. I've got the slide shell file. I want sign off and approval and agreement on this before I get into the tedious work of doing the design. Okay, it's fantastic if you do it that way so you don't waste all that extra time. And you can see by the end of this 10 step process, this is what you get. You get a presentation plan, which is fantastic for rehearsing. You can look at it digitally, you can print it out, you can take it with you. I wouldn't recommend using it as notes during the presentation because it's got a little bit too many words and too much detail on it, but you are certainly, certainly welcome, I think, to duplicate, you know, make a copy of your presentation plan and delete a whole bunch of stuff and sort of bring it down to little keywords and phrases that you can actually reference during your presentation if you're worried you might forget something, that's fine. Of course, on the right, you've got your slides both to rehearse with and to utilize in the final delivery. Now, here's the key. Trust the process. You've gotta trust the process. Anytime you go up against a presentation, you say, this is gonna be big, this is gonna be challenging, this is daunting. Let the process carry you through. Follow the process and you can be sure that you're not gonna bowl a gutter ball. <laughs> Okay, and if you do it really well, if you're highly empathetic, if you have insight into the audience, if you're a good conversationalist, if you really know your stuff, you're gonna bowl a strike often. 